So this week's discussion uh, is about the Mapo Tomyoki, the candle of the latter Dharma. Um, uh, my current personal interest has drawn me to learning a bit more about the Nyodaichi uh, Saicho, and so I picked up this writing, um, and uh, it's attributed to him, um, and it's utterly fascinating, if not totally provocative. But um, it certainly had me thinking, and so that's a bit of what I have uh, for you this evening, so bear with me. Um, and whenever you're able to head in the next slide. Thank you so much. Um, we'll cover what the text is, um, some general themes, and some considerations that need to be made when talking about those or taking those themes on the whole. Um, but we'll start uh, by looking at the text itself. Um, and, and it's said to be written around the turn of the 9th century, um, and again, attributed to Saicho. So it may not have been actually been his writing. Um, but we'll get into some of that later in the discussion. Um, but regardless, um, it's very short, um, maybe 15 pages or so uh, in this version. Uh, it's actually the last bit, only this bit. Um, so it's relatively short, but concise in its uh, succinct in its argument. Um, and uh, as the title suggests, the text is concerned with Mako, um, the age of the latter Dharma and how those who carry the light of the Buddha Dharma are meant to be viewed during this time. Um, Mapo is the third period or era from that of Shakyamuni Buddha, uh, again referred to as the latter Dharma or degenerate <coughs> Dharma, where it's said to be much more difficult to hear, experience the true essence of the teachings, and therefore more difficult to gain awakening. Uh, the true Dharma, said to have um, lasted 500 years after the time of Shakyamuni Buddha, um, followed by the imitative or semblance dharma for another 500 to 1,000 years, depending on, um, on the sources you refer to. And so Japan was very aware of its distance um, from the historical center in, uh, in time and place. So Buddhists knew well that they were entering, uh, if not already, in the midst of Mapo. Therefore, this text was timely um, in that it offered a lot of the discussion about what effects Mapo was having um, during that time. This continued until the 12th century when Pure Land uh, founders used the text to give credence to Tariki, the uh, use of outside power, uh, outside influence um, that was needed during Mapo, um, and uh, in, in more than just simple teachings. Uh, so the text was a huge statement at that time because its main points contributed much to the debate about how Mapo was playing out in the world. Slide, please. Um, it, it posits that during Mapo, a true Buddhist uh, would be different than that during the age of the true Dharma. We cannot expect that monks and nuns um, would be able to follow the precepts as fervently during Mapo because the very nature of what Mapo represents. How are we to follow the true Dharma when there is no true Dharma to follow? As we get further from Shakyamuni Buddha's teachings, monks, nuns, I'll, I'll say monks to encompass both, um, they're less able to perfect the practice and embody the teachings. Therefore, even those at the, uh, that only shave their head and wear the robes, a nominal monk, as it's termed, um, would be the treasure to the nation during this period of time. So much so, he goes to great lengths um, to argue this point. Um, and it's in a lot of question and answer uh, repose. So the question here says, I can see that the true, imitative, and latter dharmas are described in many sutras, but in what scripture does the argument that the nominal bhikshu, monk, of the latter dharma is the true treasure of the world appear? The answer, in Roll 9 of the Great Collection Sutra, it is stated, for example, pure gold is considered a priceless treasure, but if gold, pure gold did not exist, then silver would be considered a priceless treasure. If silver did not exist, then brass, a false treasure, would be considered a priceless treasure. If a false treasure did not exist, then cuprite, nickel, iron, pewter, lead, or tin would be considered a priceless treasure. Likewise, in the entire world, 
the Buddha treasure is priceless. If the Buddha treasure did not exist, then the Pratika Buddha would be considered supreme. If not Pratika Buddha existed, then, then the Arhat would be considered supreme. And et cetera, et cetera. Can you see where we're going here? So he goes on to great detail throughout the text to quote many sutras to reaffirm this position. The Sutra of the Good Eon, the Nirvana Sutra, Sutra of Maya, uh, Benevolent Kings Sutra, uh, the Great Collection Sutra, along with various Chinese commentary, commentaries, etc. The use of these sutras from the true Dharma explain what will become of the Dharma during the latter period. Therefore, since Mapo describes the conditions that the Buddhist community finds itself in, the community of faithful should keep in mind those characteristics when perceiving the world around them, and to be grateful for any representation of the Dharma. It's the Dharma, after all. For to be inevitably fading away, any exposure to the Buddha Dharma would be a miracle. <clears throat> and, and those monks who may uh, not be gr a great example of how to be are only seen that way because they are compared to those of the true Dharma age, where it was easier to be a monk. I, I contend with this. It may not be. It may not have actually been easier. But um, regardless, we, we cannot make those two comparisons. Uh, we should understand the limited capabilities as a manifestation of Mapo. It never says that monks shouldn't follow the precepts, but that we cannot hold the same standards, especially considering possible political oversight. Now, presumably, I, I, have to, I have to assume some of you might be thinking, is this actually sideshow? Because this sounds a little different than what I would have normally considered. Wouldn't be too far wrong. There is a great debate about, again, who actually wrote this. However, however, I do want to provide the historical perspective relating back to this kind of the political oversight again. Because um, from the very first paragraph of the text, it refers to the relationship between, oh, I'm sorry, slide, please. Um, the relationship between the religious and governmental leaders. So, um, <clears throat> he who conforms to the one thusness while spreading his teaching is the Dharma king. He who virtues permeate the four seas and, and transmits his influence among the people is the benevolent king. This being so, the Dharma king and the benevolent king work together to reveal each other's presence and enlighten all beings. The absolute truth and the secular truth rely on each other and spread the teachings. It is therefore, uh, it is for this reason that the profound writings of Buddhism will fill the world and sage counsel overflows under heaven. Now we foolish monks accept and obey the heavenly net of the nation's laws and respect and obey the emperor's severe decree. There is no time for us to rest complacent. To put that into context, as it needs some, um, at this time near the end of the 8th century, Emperor Kamu was laying out increasingly strict policies trying to uh, control ordination and the actions of monks in Japan. One policy in particular in, in 798, Saisho would have been 31, um, for example, required monks um, to be in the age of 35 and to pass several tests before taking ordination. Um, and it also it allowed the emperor to revoke that ordination, returning the monk to the laity if they had broken any precepts. Um, <clears throat> and to understand that, <laughs> um, it, we have to know that there were some really shady monks. Uh, uh, who were causing some major issues in the court at the time. One even tried to use his power and influence to try to usurp the throne. So uh, we can understand why Emperor Kamu uh, had some reason to be skeptical of portions of the Buddhist community. Saicho would have been well aware of all this. He saw what was happening in Nara and how the Vinaya um, was not being as, as held to as before. It's one of the main purposes why he created the Bodhisattva vows to begin with. And for his part, Emperor Kamu is trying to lead a moralistic society through the use of Buddhist teachings. And then the various, various the, the very representations that um, are supposed to, uh, uh, the representations of that religion are becoming arrogant and power hungry. So he increasingly lays out policies that try to limit the monks. 
Saicho is trying to work with the Emperor with Emperor Kamu to establish Yezan and to and administer over his own ordained priests. But the Emperor's policies would have been very difficult to manage if that was the case. And thus, this lays the groundwork for the argument that this text is the writing of Saicho as being his presumed response to these policies. And it's a stark negation of them, at it, to say the least. Not to say that the precepts should not be followed, but instead to explain those in government the situation that the Buddhist community finds itself in, that all Japanese <laughs> Buddhism finds itself in. The degeneration of monkhood is not the fault of the monks themselves. Rather, in the age of the latter Dharma, the true Buddhists are destined to be unable to keep the precepts. The policies were fundamentally mistaken because they tried to regulate the monks' way of life in the latter Dharma, with the precepts meant for an age when the true Dharma still existed. There's also an argument here for Saicho's authorship of this text because it was, in fact, referring to the Vinaya as being um, that which uh, a monk could no longer follow. So I, I personally had a few questions about this, um, and, and so I might ask, for example, could it have been that the candle of the latter Dharma was arguing not for following the Vinaya precepts as a way to emphasize a new paradigm? How could monks uphold vows from a previous age? Uh, Saito, uh, I, another question I had was Saito also saw a lot of hierarchy within society and may have and within the Buddhist order and may have argued that some monks were able to keep the precepts and they would stay on the mountain practicing, whereas other monks may not have been able to follow the precepts as well and would have been teachers or members of the society still following the, the teachings but not as uh, uh, doing the practices on the mountain. I don't know. I'm just putting this out there. <laughs> uh, slide, please. Because in the end, most scholars agree that. Oh, that was the last bit. I'm sorry, one more before we match. Um, because most scholars agree that um, that Saicho wasn't actually the one who wrote this. Uh, it was attributed to him. Robert Rhodes, um, the translator actually for this uh, this version, describes two main reasons listed why they believe this. Firstly, uh, Saicho was deeply committed to the precepts. Um, and, and, and despite Mapo, he had, clear, he had a clear opinion that because we know we are in Mapo, why wouldn't you want to escape to the mountains to practice in peace? He felt that there had to be specific teachings precisely because we we're in Mapo, although he was careful not to use Mapo as the reasoning for those teachings. He also developed the Bodhisattva vows based on the Brahmajala Sutra and spells out a lot, about, uh, a lot of the Tendai orthodoxy within the Kenkaidon translated as a clarification of the precepts, um, when he stressed the significance of the Bodhisattva precepts. And, and point number two is that it, in all of his other writings, Saicho always referred to Mapo as starting 2,000 years uh, after the time of Shakyamuni Buddha. And in this text, um, he seems to stray from that. He explains many of the different perspectives of those time frames, but settles um, 1,500 years. So there's also reasons it's rarely categorized in um, amongst his writings. Um, it's not even first mentioned until Honen, 400 years later. There are some, there are some holes. Like this. Um, regardless of its authorship, it certainly gave people much to think about during the late Han period. Because by the beginning of the Kamakura period, um, it becomes an important point of discussion um, for many uh, of the new schools of Japanese Buddhism. And two standouts here, Honen and Shinran, um, the Mapo argument in this text helped to bolster the perspective that our only salvation is through Amida Buddha. Shinran also used specific quotes to justify not following the precepts at all, but that's a whole other story. This, this, the text is also uh, a counterpoint for Issei, the founder of Rinzai Zen, who held firmly to the precepts and that Zazen meditation was the perfect tool for practice during Mapo. So in, this, in, this, in his refuting of uh, um, the candle of the latter Dharma, he may have actually helped to define his particular school at that time. So 
Jan Nati describes that there are two main responses to the challenge of Mapo that the candle of the latter Dharma puts forth. One is to answer uh, by responding by holding the precepts more fervently. Right? She describes it as we try harder approach. So Isai would have been in this group. If we were we if we are in the final stage, we need to be relying on the true Dharma and redouble our efforts since there's a reduced capacity for a spiritual accomplishment. On the other hand, as Honan asserts, considering our uh, decreased ability, certain teachings and practices may have been appropriate in an earlier age, but now we find ourselves in a different uh, era, and new spiritual practice and approach is necessary. Needless to say, uh, in either response, it, it provides provocative contemplation about what is to be done or the perspective to take during this latter age. Slide, please. Although the history and context are interesting, taking the text merely at face value, I, I, I've considered my own personal takeaways. So as I see it, and please correct me if I'm wrong, um, we should hold on to both responses. Um, because Sancho led by example in both of these responses. He knew well that his establishment of Hiezan was already at the edge of Mapo. He was per purposefully pioneering to find and um, bring particular teachings like the Lotus Sutra and practices like meditation and Butsu and esoteric ritual into an orthodoxy of a new school being created at the time when the teachings should be in decline. The Vinaya was not being followed anyway. His, his, formula, his formation of the Bodhisattva precepts was, maybe only in a small part, due to the advent of Mapo and being aware that the situation for monks had changed. So instead of trying harder through the Vinaya, the, the Bodhisattva precepts offered a way to pivot into a new formation way, a formative way to redouble one's efforts. But mostly the point of the text may be stated as such. We cannot vilify those that don't follow the precepts well during this our current time. Um, isn't good better than not any good? Um, it, it, there, there's a gradient. And, and any amount in the direction of the, uh, the true Dhar Buddha Dharma helps to keep it alive. If we assert that Mapu is actually happening, Okay. This is all based on the assertion that Mapo's actually happened. There are always going to be those that degenerate the Dharma. But Saicho aimed to ensure that there were monks that held to the precepts fervently, and they would stay on the mountain keeping the candle, uh, the candle light alive. Because, of course, not all monks would hold the precepts universally, so they fulfilled other roles within the Sangha. It isn't enough that those lower monks, it, uh, is, it an, is it enough? that those lower monks aroused their bodhicitta, the seed of awakening, at least during this age. Look, uh, uh, we have to know that Mapo is difficult, hard to deal with if, if, if it stands true. I mean, wouldn't it have been nice to have been practicing uh, so for several years, go on a walkabout, meet up with some noble guy named Vimalakirti, like we talked about last, uh, last week, Here's some nice little discourse, and boom! Like, see into the nature of reality. <laughs> it's not how that happens. Um, and, excuse me, so there's my place. Um, uh, so we can still have these glimpses of truths um, during Mapo, here and there throughout our lives, but uh, maybe they are more fleeting and live in the kokoro, the heart-mind, not as long. Or maybe we simply can't experience them in the same way, deluded as we are. Or maybe Mapo is only contrived to continue to help spur those in, at, in this age on to learning and experiencing the Dharma. I don't know. I mean, either way, this work seeks to determine the, the, the concept of what a true Buddhist is the bearer of the light of the Buddhist teachings in the age of the latter Dharma. It doesn't mean that you don't follow the precepts. It means, holy cow, you follow the precepts? How, that's, so, that's so hard and inconvenient. 
Oh, I have to admit, I'm, I may slip up here and there, you know, as... Well, sure, I can't blame you, right? So, all that being said, the text provided food for thought, which helped to create new schools, regardless of whether they were for or against this idea, since each school had an emphasis on particular practices to overcome Mako, and now are being practices by millions of people every day. We may find that our, our responses to this text may fall in line with how Na Jen Nantier describes them in either, in either response, uh, either a doubling down or a shift and pivot. But I would argue that if we presume the characteristics of Mapo to be valid, then during this age, we have to hold both as true and act accordingly. How else, as followers of the Buddha Dharma, carry the candle during this time? Thank you. Uh, next slide.